Good morning, church family, friends, and first-time guests. I'm Pastor Prince Rivers, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to worship today. It is my hope and my prayer that you will encounter the presence of God this morning. And we believe that worship is vital to the life of faith because we become more like what we worship. If you desire prayer during the service or if you want to become a part of this fellowship, I invite you to give us a call at 855-PRAY-UBC. The opening selection today is Lift Him Up. It's a song of gratitude and thanksgiving to God and praise for what Christ has done for us. So this morning, let's sing together, Lift Him Up. Thank you, Music Ministry. Now, let me share with you a little bit about what's happening in and around the church. Tomorrow night, Monday, September the 28th at 6 p.m., we're going to host an online political forum, Pews to the Polls, exercising political power during a pandemic. I want you to see the church's website for more information and to register. I cannot underscore how important this election is. If we don't get out and vote, we will regret it, so make sure that you and everybody you know is registered, and whether you vote early, whether you vote on election day, or whether you mail in your ballot, 
do whatever you have to do to make sure your voice is heard. Now, UBC parents, you have another opportunity to meet with our children's minister, Reverend Ashley Cross. This Saturday, October the 3rd at 10 a.m., please visit the website to sign up. As we prepare to receive your stewardship today, you know you have four ways that you can give. You can give through the church's secure website. You can give through your bank's online bill pay. You can mail in your tithes and offerings, or you can stop by the church and drop off your gifts curbside from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Saturday. Let us pray. God, we are grateful and thankful for every good and perfect gift. We know that your generosity is the only reason we live and move and have our being. So use these gifts for the upbuilding and the furtherance of your kingdom. Let justice be done. Let compassion be experienced. And let the love of Christ be known throughout the world. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, UBC. Our morning scripture will come from Psalm 133. It says, how good and pleasant it is for brethren and sisters to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of the robe. It is as the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. Let us pray. Most wise and heavenly God, we come to say thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing our eyes to behold a brand new day. Lord, we're living in turbulent and tumultuous times, Lord, where the world is fraught with injustice and mendacity. But God, however, your word is still true, God. And God, right now we are still trusting and depending on you for God justice to roll down like waters. And God, we are just praying for your righteousness to roll down like an ever-flowing stream. So God, even right now, we do not become pessimistic or we do not hold to now these, these kind of nihilistic assumptions, God, but we stick to your word, God, and we are leaning and trusting in you. God, we pray for the preacher as he comes to break the word of life. God, give him power so that he may be able to preach your uncompromising gospel, God. God, bless Union Baptist Church as we extend our footprint in this community. God, allow us to go everywhere telling and sharing the good news of Christ, Lord. God, bless us Keep us in this pandemic so that we can come out of here with a testimony saying that, God, there is no secret, God. God, what you can do even in moments like this. Bless our time. Thank you for blessing us. And all these blessings we ask in your son's name. Amen.
sometimes we have to press not only to get into the Lord's presence, but to stay in the Lord's presence. So I want us to look today at the 10th chapter of the book of Joshua. I'm going to start reading at verse 6 down to verse 15. It says, The Gibeonites sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took, up, took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon and Azekah, the Lord hurled hailstones down on them and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all the Israelites to the camp at Gilgal. Let us pray together. Eternal and gracious God, we are thankful and grateful for the strength to press this morning. And we ask now that you would take your servant and hide him squarely behind the cross, that your people would see less of him and more of you, because you, God, are our rock and you are our redeemer. This is our prayer in the name and spirit of Jesus the Christ. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. As we think about pressing, today I want to continue in our series on life's survival guide under the theme, when the odds are against you. When the odds are against you. Over the past few weeks, two of America's great pastimes have reemerged. The first pastime is sports. I'm talking about uh, football in particular. Some colleges have chosen to cancel their fall seasons, but, but other schools are playing with shortened season. And, and, and given all the money that's being made and the athletes that have to prepare, many schools have decided to hit the grit, gridiron, and, and basketball we know is not far behind. The stadiums now are mostly empty, but one thing has not changed. People still ask the same question week after week, and that is, who do you think is going to win the game? Sometimes the question is not easy to answer. The two teams look evenly matched, or one of the teams is known to be inconsistent. You never know who's going to win a game like that. There are times when this question is a lot easier to answer. Uh, just look at the two teams, look at their records, look at their players, look at their coaches. Even the commentators are unambiguous that one team has a significant advantage over the other team. Fans show up to the game as a mere formality because one of the schools uh, has such a high chance of winning that winning is almost guaranteed. But for the other school, we say that the odds are stacked against them. So that's the first pastime that has reemerged. The second of America's favorite pastimes that we saw in the news this week was injustice. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I do believe that this political experiment that we call democracy is a worthy ideal, but, but too often there's a difference between the ideal and what happens in reality. 
This week, a lot of people, and not just those in Kentucky, not just the family and friends of Breonna Taylor, not just people of color, but a lot of people feel like the odds are stacked against them. What do you say when someone gets murdered in her own apartment and the attorney general doesn't even indict uh, the people who pulled the trigger or doesn't indict them for a charge that is really serious by some accounts, by some accounts, uh, if you take another uh, form of injustice, absentee ballots from black voters are more than twice as likely to be rejected as the absentee ballots from white voters in 2018 and it certainly seems like the odds are not in somebody's favor. Citigroup conducted a study in which they found that the U.S. has experienced a $13 trillion loss in potential business revenue because of past discrimination against African-American entrepreneurs. It seems like the odds are against us. And when the odds are against you, it is hard but not impossible to win. When the odds are against you, you, you are concerned about every detail because the enemy can take advantage and exploit even the slightest error. When when the odds are against you, you have to keep up the morale because the stronger opponent will exploit every weakness. When the odds are against you, there is no time for letting down your guard or you'll quickly lose the advantage that you may have gained. When the odds are against you, you have to be creative and resourceful to accomplish what no one else thinks you can do. Have the odds ever been against you? Do you feel like the odds are against you right now? That is a vulnerable place to be. That is a precarious situation. When the odds are against us, we strain in our mind and our body and our soul. We, we smile like everything is fine, but on the inside, we're not 100% sure. We're, we're not sure when we start this business or perform in this new job or try to overcome this grief or write that new book or raise that child or pursue that degree or break that habit. We don't know how things are going to turn out. You see, it's one thing to be on lockdown when the pantry is full, when the bank account is full, when, when bodies are well, when income is secure, when RBG is still alive, and when children are at school. It's another thing to find out that the safety net has holes in it. Friends have not shown themselves to be reliable. Expenses are higher than income. Health is quite Questionable, and God doesn't feel as close as we need God to be. What makes me think about this church is the way that the Gibeonites cried out to Joshua for help in the 10th chapter in the book of Joshua. Now, don't worry if you've never heard of the Gibeonites. We'll say more about them in just a moment. But first, you should know that the book of Joshua is, in many ways, a book about survival. Joshua covers the period from the time when the Israelites came out of wandering in the wilderness uh, for 40 years where, uh, after their slavery in Egypt uh, for, for, for many, many years. And, and I want to acknowledge up front that the book of Joshua ha has been shown uh, to be problematic for some people. Why? Because there's no way to read the book of Joshua and not see violence and bloodshed and death and conquest. The book of Joshua describes entire groups of people being wiped out, killed, and destroyed. Some of the most terrible things and cruel things that people have done in history and that nations have done in the name of God have been justified by some of the bloodshed and violence like we see in the book of Joshua. However, I need you to know today that the Bible does not have two different gods. That is the God of Jesus who told, told us to turn the other cheek and the God of Joshua who seems to condone violence. No, what we're supposed to learn from Joshua is not what European colonizers used to justify the desecration of Africa and the genocide of Native Americans. Their interpretive errors have caused unbelievable pain and suffering. So I want you to learn a couple of things that the scholars tell us about the violence in the book of Joshua. First, much of the violence is in Joshua is in self-defense or the result of the Israelites defending an ally who was under attack like in Joshua chapter 10. God was never authorizing unprovoked aggression but that's the first thing. The second thing is that the violence that was unprovoked was usually 
uh, metaphorical and not literal. That is, when God told Israel to wipe out children and uh, women and uh, men and women and the disabled, that was not a call to genocide, but a call to radical loyalty to God. The call to violence was not for them to pick up arms and not to exterminate other people. It was to eliminate all foreign religious influences. God was telling Israel, have no other gods besides me. Even Jesus said things like, you cannot follow me unless you hate your mother and your father. That was not a call to hate somebody. It was a call to be loyal to him above all other commitments. Why? Because God is a covenant making God and God expects his covenant to be exclusive and so for Israel to be faithful to the covenant they could not run after God and have another God as a backup God. You know how we do. We like to keep a little spiritual something, something in reserve just in case we pray and we follow our horoscopes just to be on the safe side. The book of Joshua was about being committed to the God of Israel and no other God. In Joshua 10, we can see that the Israelites weren't looking for any trouble. They were minding their own business and a people called the Gibeonites came to them and asked for help. Gibeon was facing an attack from several kings, not just one king, not two kings, not three kings, but five kings were coming to destroy the Gibeonites. The odds were against them. You see, the city of Gibeon was strategically located, and in Joshua 9, uh, the Israelites made a treaty with them. Go, go back and read that. Uh, the treaty meant that Joshua was bound to protect them, and the Gibeonites were obligated to serve Israel. Because Gibeon was st strategically located, these five kings decided to make war on Gibeon and gain the city for their advantage against the Israelites. Uh, and with these five kings coming against their city, the Gibeonites had nowhere to turn except their ally, Joshua and the Israelites. The odds were against them. The Gibeonites were good fighters, but uh, uh, they might have stood a chance against one king, maybe two kings, but, but the odds of success in a war against five kings simultaneously were not good. And so when Gibeon heard that their enemies were coming out against them, they sent word to Joshua in verse 6. Do not abandon your servants. Come help us quickly and save us. Help us because the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. The Gibeonites were afraid. They did not want to be conquered. And how were they supposed to fight off five kings at one time? The odds were against them. They had little chance of survival. From a military perspective, uh, the chance for victory did not look good. So what does God call us to do when the odds are unfavorable in our life, when there is voter suppression and voter intimidation, when the glass ceiling gets thicker every year, when the options are few? You've got to take your cues, not from what you see out there, but from Joshua and the Gibeonites. And the first thing that you and I have to do when the odds are against us is to place our confidence in what God says rather than than in what we see. Verse 7 says Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army including the best of the fighting men but I don't think it was the size of his army that made a difference for him if God wants to do something God uh, does not need crowds to get it done God refused to send a man named Gideon into battle until Gideon shrunk his army down from 32,300 so I I'm not sure sure that the size of Joshua's army is the focus here, nor do I think it was the skill of his soldiers because even though God gives us skill and we ought to be glad about it, I can see that Jesus took some fishermen and some tax collectors and turned them into fishers of men and used them to turn the world upside down. There's something else that God wants us to see. Look at uh, verse 8. Uh, the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. Then the Lord said to Joshua, do 
not be afraid of them. You see, while Joshua marched up uh, to the battleground, God spoke to him. Joshua heard uh, from the messenger that the five kings were on their way to do battle against Gibeon and, and the Israelites. But then, after he heard from the messenger, he heard from the word of God, do not be afraid of them. I've given them into your hands. You, you've got to place your confidence in what God says rather than in how things look. Joshua, like any good general, had uh, people that advised him. He had leaders around him who understood the art of war. However, the words of his commanding officers uh, are not recorded in the text today. Only the words of God to him going into battle against five kings. Things did not look good, but, but Joshua's chance for success and victory changed just drastically when he put his confidence in what the Lord said rather than in how things looked around him. Often things are not going to look favorable for, for us. Um, the outcomes are, are, are going to look uncertain. Elections are going to feel flawed, but remember what you've heard, not just what you see, because when the Israelites were in the wilderness, Moses sent 12 spies to investigate uh, the promised land. Ten spies brought back a report about what they saw. Uh, the people in the land looked like giants, Moses. They saw uh, themselves as mere grasshoppers. And, and in their mind, uh, the conclusion was defeat is inevitable. But two spies brought back a report based on faith. They said, yes, the people in the land are mighty, but if God has commanded us, if God has directed us, if God has told us to do this, then we ought to go into the land and not waste our time worrying and talking about the size of the people. We've got to focus on the power of our God. If you and I are going to deal with the days when the odds are stacked against us, we've got to know how to put more confidence in what God says to us than in how things look around us. God said nothing to Joshua about what a big army he had. He said nothing to Joshua about how mighty his soldiers were. God said, put your confidence in me. Don't be afraid of them. I have given them into your hands. And beloved, I hope you're listening today because you got to be confident in God and not paralyzed by what you see. You have to be confident in God and not listen to what you hear around you. You've got to tune in to the next message from heaven rather than the enemy's tricks and schemes. Now is the time for confidence in what God says. People need our help like the Gibeonites needed Israel's help. Uh, oppressive forces are conspiring to work against us. Now is the time for confidence in what God says because our eyes can deceive us. Imagine Joshua looking off into the distance and seeing the dust rising up from the wheels of the chariots of the five kings and, 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 the, and, the, and the sand kicking up from, from the marching foot soldiers that were coming against him and the fear that might have gripped his heart and the, uh, the sound of the war cries from those five uh, kings and their armies and then listen to what Joshua heard do not be afraid of them and Joshua says you mean them Lord the army coming against me and Joshua and the Lord says yeah don't be afraid of them but Lord do you see them and Joshua don't, don't be a, a pay attention to them uh, put your confidence in what I'm telling you uh, because if you're confident in what I say to you it won't matter that the odds are against you. Well Joshua must have believed what God told him based on what happened in verse 9 it says that he and his army marched all night from the camp at Gilgal to the city of Gibeon. You see, reading this lets me know that when the odds are against us, in addition to hearing God more than what we see, we've got to put forth maximum effort. The text says that Joshua marched all night long. I want you to be honest. I've got to be honest too. Sometimes things don't work out because we don't give it our best effort. 
We don't nail the presentation because we didn't practice. We, we don't reach our goal because we didn't got relaxed. We, God is not expecting perfection, but God responds when we give our best effort. In the Gospel of Mark, a father brought his son to the disciples so they could cast out a demon from him, but they could not do it. Jesus came back, cast the demon out, and the disciples pulled Jesus aside later and said, Master, why couldn't we cast the demon out? Jesus said, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. In other words, you can't just do that little bit of stuff you've been doing. You've got to put forth some more effort if you want to access my power. You see, the fact of the matter is we won't be perfect in this lifetime, but God delights when we give God our best effort. It may not always work out the way we want it to, but let's not be judged by a lack of effort. The text tells us that Joshua marched all night long. He knew that the Gibeonites were in trouble. He knew that the enemy was getting closer. He understood that time was of the essence. He didn't say we'll go in the morning. He did not take the scenic route. Joshua and his army marched all night long. It was late, but they kept marching to Gibeon. It got dark, but they kept marching to Gibeon. They, they were tired. They got hungry, but they kept marching to Gibeon. They gave their best effort. I tell you, maximum effort can make all the difference in the world because underdogs win when they give a better effort than the team that expected to win easily. Businesses can go from failure to success if the entrepreneur is willing to march all night long. Students can excel in difficult classes if they're willing to march all night long. You can climb out of debt if you're willing to march all night long. You can finish whatever you started if you march all night long. You can come through rehabilitation if you march all night long. You may have to put forth a little more effort than you've been doing, but, but I believe that God responds when we give the effort. I, I, I wish I knew Joshua's motivation. Maybe he just didn't want to lose control of the city of Gibeon. Maybe he wanted to honor the treaty that he made with Gibeon. Maybe Joshua was just a warrior and he hadn't fought and a while he was looking for a good fight I don't know but I do know that not even a lack of sleep prevented him from showing up when the Gibeonites needed his help even though he had to march all night long you see if we need a reason to put forth more effort. I, I tell you, you've got to know that when you get, when the odds are against you, maximum effort uh, will work because it doesn't matter who's against you uh, uh, when God is for you. When, when the odds are against you, put forth maximum effort because God's grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect in your weakness. For Ezra to rebuild the temple after it was destroyed, he had to give maximum effort. When Nehemiah wanted to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem and he did it in 52 days it required maximum effort when Jesus said love the Lord your God with all your heart your mind your soul your strength he was talking about maximum effort when Paul said I press to take hold of the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus he was talking about maximum effort and Jesus said no greater love hath a man than this that he would lay down his life for his friends he was talking about maximum effort. Well, as it turns out, Joshua arrived just in time. The Bible says that he caught the five kings by surprise. The Lord threw the five kings into confusion and, and Joshua defeated them at Gibeon. That could have been the end of the story, except for the fact that in Joshua chapter 10, we get to one of the most unusual and miraculous events in the Bible that happened after the battle was over. Scripture says that Israel pursued the defeated armies and as they fled from Israel, God sent hail and it pounded down and terrified the troops. And then the scripture says that more of the enemy died from the hail than from the sword of the Israelites. After the hail, Joshua did something that nobody before him and no one after him in the Bible has ever done. He asked God to do something that God uh, really uh, must 
must have surprised God to hear this request. On the day that the Lord gave Joshua the victory, Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still and the moon to stop moving. I, I want you to hear me this morning. Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still and the moon to stop moving. He prayed for a pause in the movement of the, of the sun and the moon. Now, don't get yourself bogged down in astrological facts when you're trying to make sense of the miraculous and the metaphorical. You see, we know that the sun does not revolve around the moon, uh, 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 rather around the earth, and uh, the earth revolves around the sun. We know that, uh, that we know that, but this is why the Bible was never intended to be a science textbook. It's rather a faith guidebook because when the odds are against you, I want you to do what Joshua did this morning. Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still and commanded the moon not to move. Verse 13 says that's exactly what happened. The sun stood still and the moon did not move until all of Israel's enemies were defeated. This tells us that uh, what to do when the odds are against us. It tells us how to respond when we can't be sure if things are going to work out in our favor. The first thing you've got to do is place more confidence in what God says rather than in what you see. The second thing you've got to do is put forth maximum effort because God will honor the effort that you put forth. But if you really want to see God doing something amazing, if you really want to see God do the miraculous, I want you to pray a big prayer and then see what God will do. Because big is the only way I can describe Joshua's prayer for the sun to stand still and the moon to remain in place. Joshua prayed a big prayer. He prayed for the sun to stop and the moon to go offline. Joshua didn't worry about the fact that it had never happened before. By faith, he simply prayed that it would happen when he prayed. He was not constrained by the size of his prayer because sometimes we only pray what we can answer for ourselves so we don't risk being disappointed when God does something else. But every now and then, we ought to pray a God-sized prayer. You see, don't look now, but 2020 is the perfect year for us to pray a God-sized prayer. Here's one of those prayers. God, let your justice roll down like a river and your righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Here's another prayer. God, let your kingdom come on earth just like it is in heaven. A God-sized prayer is a prayer that only God can answer. There was no way Joshua could reach out and touch the sun. There was no way God could reach out and grab the moon. So he said, I'll pray a God-sized prayer. And when the odds are against you, you've got to know that you're praying to a big God. You're praying to a faithful God. And you're praying to a good God. You're praying to a God and the earth will tremble at his voice. You're praying to a God and the powers and principalities cannot stand against what he says. You're praying to a big God and even kings have to bow before him. I said the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. So when the odds are against you, and you start to pray your prayer. Don't waste your time on a teeny tiny prayer. Don't go to God with one of those petite prayers. Forget about those miniature meditations. When you need the sun to stop, look at God and say, God, stop the sun. When you need the moon to pause, look up at God and say, God, pause the moon. I want you to pray a prayer and know that you're praying to the same God that made the Red Sea go uh, uh, divide so Israel can get over on dry ground. When you pray to a big God, I want you to know he can open new horizons for you. And when you pray to a big God, I want you to know he can make giants fall. He can make walls come down. I want you to know that even though you don't have the power, even though you don't know how it will be done, I've got a God 
that can make a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Because all I know is that every time the odds are against God, God finds a way to get out of what you put him in. God finds a way. God makes a way. God builds a way. So you got to keep on praying and keep on trusting and keep on believing that God will. God will and God can make a way somehow. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Yeah, don't, don't let the odds get you down. We've seen all of this before. Don't let the odds get you down. You, we've got to pray a big prayer and put forth maximum effort. And if we can do that, I think God can defeat no matter how many kings are coming against us. One king, two kings, three, four, or five kings. Because the scripture says, on that day, the Lord was fighting for Israel. If you're here today and watching us and you want prayer today, call us at 855-PRAY-UBC. I've been captured a love I can't explain. Now you have me, and I'm forever changed. And I've abandoned everything I've ever known. Now I surrender, my life is not my own. I belong. made that decision it's still not too late call us at 855 pray UBC one of our ministers will receive your call today I pray that you have a blessed week I pray that everybody you touch experiences the joy and the goodness of God and I pray that the Lord will open up a path for you 
as you go out doing whatever you have to do. Be the light of the, the world and the salt of the earth. Put forth maximum effort and pray a big prayer. Receive this blessing from the Lord. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forevermore. And all of God's people said amen and amen.